Good morning. I'd like to thank Mr. Mark Izzard, Mr. John Clarkson, and the organizers of this wonderful meeting for having me here to speak to you about my experience with preservation of rhinoplasty. This is my contact information. I'm sure some questions may arise. Please feel free to message me uh, and ask me questions later on. Uh, and I have no financial disclosures relevant to this talk. I would encourage you to check out these references for further reading. So what are we talking about with preservation of rhinoplasty? Well, preservation of rhinoplasty can mean preservation of the osteocartilaginous fault or dorsal preservation of rhinoplasty, preservation of the cartilaginous structures, the, the skin soft tissue envelope, or the uh, ligamentous structures of the tip. Um, I'm gonna concentrate really on osteocartilaginous vault preservation. That's where my experience comes in and talk to you about what I mean when I say structural preservation of rhinoplasty, which is really combining the best of both words, the worlds, uh, in my opinion, with tip structural methods and osteocartilaginous fault preservation. This concept uh, of preservation of the osteocartilaginous fault is not a new one, even though it has recently been revived and, and popularized with the term preservation rhinoplasty. Um, it's been around for a long time, uh, in fact, um, there's a paper in this new issue of Facial Plastic Surgery Clinics that uh, Gene Kern, who's uh, uh, been a longtime proponent of this method, has written, which talks about the history of it. And these are a couple of excerpts from that paper. Uh, and basically, you know, Dr. Goodale, uh, who's a US surgeon, first described this, at least as far as we can find in the literature, in 1899. And this is an image uh, from uh, his original description. Now, of course, we talk about the caudal method nowadays. Caudal sort of picked up on this and I think was the major proponent of it through the mid uh, 20th century. But at the same time, there were two schools. The other school was the, the Joseph technique, which was dorsal resection, uh, which uh, had started also in the late uh, 1800s. Uh, and uh, of course, Dr. Joseph really popularized. So when we talk about the Joseph versus caudal methods, we're talking about dorsal resection versus osteocartilaginous preservation. Uh, and as I mentioned, Goodale was really the first to describe basically impacting the, the uh, osteocartilaginous vault of, of the nose into the mid face. And this initial operation was called a pushdown. Uh, later on, uh, Lothrop described the letdown operation, although he didn't call it that at the time. And that was with ostectomies on the sides, so that rather than pressing the bones into the face, we're actually just letting the entire thing down. Uh, and I'll show you some more diagrams of that in a second. Those are the two basic ways that we uh, deal with the bony vault, a pushdown versus a letdown. A lot of the other variations, including the variation I'm going to describe to you today, uh, have to do with how you treat the septum. And Caudill's uh, method is shown here diagrammatically, and essentially it's creating an advancement flap uh, of the most of the quadrangular cartilage. Uh, whereby you resect some of the cartilage underneath the bony cap, you resect some over the maxillary crest, you make an incision from the rhinion all the way to the maxillary crest and then flex this cartilage down. Uh, this is shown here uh, in a dissection that Dr. Uh, Valerio Finocchi did at Turkey when I was at a meeting with him uh, last year. And then uh, I, I played with the specimen afterwards and this is a recording of me playing with it. And you can see here how the caudal method works. Uh, you can see the bony resection underneath, I mean, see, sorry, the cartilaginous resection under the bony cap and how this whole thing slides forward. Of course, there's tension on this you must create uh, and suture this to the maxillary spine and resect some excess cartilage here uh, at the posterior septal angle. So in cross-section, a uh, push down via the caudal method looks something like this. Uh, we would resect uh, some septum at the base um, and then push the whole thing down into the mid face. The letdown method uh, from a bony perspective is resection laterally, so an ostectomy while dropping the entire thing into place. Uh, and so, you know, I've heard about this technique for a while. I, I first heard about it from uh, Fausto Lopez Uloa and Jose Juan Amantes uh, when they would speak um, back in the uh, early 2000s. And I thought it was one of the craziest things I'd ever heard, to be honest with you. And I, I didn't really think that it was something that was viable. It was done at nasally, which I, I didn't prefer anyway. Uh, but they were getting some good results, uh, but I still didn't have any inclination to want to try it. 
in the last few years, a few things have changed my opinion. Um, and of course, Dr. Saban and Dr. Baris uh, Chekir um, at, in France and in Istanbul, uh, respectively, have really influenced me in the last few years. Uh, and there are authors on that textbook that I mentioned. And, and Saban's method when treating the septum is to do a subdorsal resection. And, uh, and he showed very nicely some really good results. But really the revelation for me was that you can do this with an external approach. And also my adoption of the use of the piezo instruments made it possible for me to consider doing this uh, technique. But before I go too far into that, I want to stress that um, the Joseph technique is a very viable method, and I still do about half of my dorsal hump reductions with this method. Um, and this is an example of a patient uh, in whom you probably would not want to try a dorsal preservation uh, technique, uh, primarily because she has a very large kyphotic, in other words, heavily angled hump. It's, uh, it's, she has long nasal bones, uh, and these are, these are sort of relative contraindications to using uh, this method. So using our standard uh, open rhinoplasty, external rhinoplasty approach, we can uh, resect this very large uh, bony hump. Uh, I use the piezo system for her. Uh, and of course, a lot of mid-ball reconstruction had to occur. There was a lot of work done to rotate her tip, including lateral curl overlay uh, and, uh, and cephalic trims and so on, uh, and careful dorsal aesthetic line reconstruction. And so here she is on the operating table, uh, and here she is two years postoperatively. Uh, and you can see that you know, this type of result, I think um, I wouldn't be able to achieve with uh, a, a dorsal preservation method. Um, you know, with her thick skin, her dorsal aesthetic lines are a little bit washed out, uh, but of course, you know, this is necessary. We had to keep that width in order to keep her airway. Uh, and here's her base view. And here's her uh, bird's eye view. Now, one thing that I'd like to introduce to you in case you don't know about it is this idea that we really should be tracking our methods with patient reported outcome measures. And my bias is towards the standardized cosmesis health nasal outcome survey or the SHNAS, which uh, we developed at Stanford and um, is highly, highly validated psychometrically. Um, and um, in fact, uh, really uh, absolutely for me, uh, important part of my practice on a daily basis. And with this, the top uh, four uh, questions are uh, breathing related and the bottom five are uh, aesthetic related as well as question five, which is more sort of psychological. Uh, and I've shown this in blue and light yellow. And this is a preoperative score for this patient. On the right side is worse, the left side is better. And so uh, we see here at 12 months, she had a significant improvement across the board, which we're very happy about. And I recently saw her for her two-year follow-up, and we've had a lot of fires and smoke around here. And interestingly, she's having a lot of nasal allergies with regards to that. But I think this will this will improve once we get some good treatment for her. But without this, uh, I really can't really keep good track of my patients. And the other thing that I've adopted is I'm going to show this uh, for every single patient for whom I have this data when I show results, in addition to what you see with the pictures. So let's get into this concept of structural preservation. What are we talking about with that? As I mentioned, a lot of the variations uh, with preservation, uh, dorsal preservation rhinoplasty have to do with how you treat the septum. Uh, and you know, with regards to the bones, there are really two methods, push down and let down. Um, and so what we're talking about here is this modified subdorsal strip method whereby we preserve this caudal strut. And to me, this is very important versus the caudal method, C-O-T-T-L-E method, where you're uh, destabilizing that and, and re-suturing it to the nasal spine. And here, this is what our cuts are in our resection is this subdorsal strip. Um, and it varies depending on how much you want to drop uh, the hump. Uh, we place a flexion cut in the dorsal segment to allow it to flex down. An osteotomy is performed at the top, of course, and this entire segment flexes into position. And there, there's a variable resection you can do on this to get this to sit the way you want it to. Um, and uh, two PDS sutures, at least one, but sometimes two PDS sutures are placed in order to hold this in position during the healing period because it may want to flex back upwards. This T strut is preserved. You can reset cartilage down below that to use for other methods, uh, structural methods you may be familiar with with external rhinoplasty. And so diagrammatically, what we're talking about here is uh, at the top, this is the caudal method. The red sections are 
the sections that are resected. Uh, the cross section is shown on the left side of the screen. You can see how it drops into position. The Saban method um, is shown in the middle section. And uh, the method that, that I like to use, that I've described, uh, is a mid, mid to high septal resection uh, and uh, preserving a subdorsal strip and a letdown operation with regards to the bones. Again, this is diagrammatically what we're doing. Think of it as a mini caudal uh, method up here high, whereby we flex the whole thing down and suture it into position. And the key to structural preservation for me is preserving that caudal strut because um, I like to use septal extension grafts, tongue and groove method, and other things whereby that caudal strut is of utmost importance. Uh, and so for me, structural preservation around plasty is preservation of the osseocartilaginous vault of the nose, but manipulation of the tip tripod complex with open structural techniques. And so we published this. This paper is actually open access. I, I allowed it to be open access, so this is freely downloadable uh, at the Facial Plastic Surgery and Aesthetic Medicine website, which is formerly JAMA Facial Plastic Surgery. Uh, and let's get into some cases. So this is one of the early cases that I, that I did. Uh, if you analyze her closely, you can see she has an asymmetry of her dorsum. Um, she has a very nice well-defined tip with the left uh, tip defining point a bit more highlighted than the right. She didn't really need any tip work whatsoever, maybe a very slight amount of deep projection, mostly dorsal work. And since it was sort of a gentle curve, even though it's a rather high hump, I decided that uh, we would try uh, a letdown operation. And so cross-sectionally, this is what we did. We resected bone for a letdown and dropped the entire thing down into position. Um, this is showing preserving that uh, caudal strut of septum. This is the initial cut in the septum. And then we make a uh, double horizontal cut to resect a portion of the cartilage. In some patients, that cartilage will extend all the way up and you won't have to do any bony work. Um, this is showing how you can flex this up and down once you've done that. And sutured into position at the height that you want uh, using a PDS suture. This is showing that, again, that caudal strut being preserved and, and on side view with the domes pulled down so you can see how you've got that high up there. And it's, it's really great for doing ailer spanning sutures or things like that. Uh, and this is our, our diagram, uh, our Gunter diagram of what we did, which was fairly straightforward. Here's our uh, result on the operating table. And here she is at 12 months. Uh, and so uh, she's healed uh, very nicely. Um, and here's her three quarters view, her frontal view, which shows really nice dorsal aesthetic lines. This is the thing that really, I think, sets it apart for me is that uh, it's very smooth, these results. Uh, and really no palpable irregularities whatsoever. It's the natural dorsum. Uh, so that is the thing I think that I like the most. If you felt this nose, you felt prosteotomies laterally, you wouldn't feel anything. And of course the dorsum uh, feels very smooth. So I, I really like it. You can see here there was a little bit of deep projection. And this is her uh, bird's eye view at 12 months. And importantly here, her schnoz scores preoperatively, just a little bit of congestion, not a big deal, but you can see here that her main concerns were number seven, which is the straightness of her nose, and number eight, which is, of course, the profile, the shape from the side. And you can see uh, postoperatively at 12 months, she's uh, very happy across the board. Uh, so we've been tracking these results, and, and our patients seem to be very happy with this method. Here's another patient. Um, and so this is a little bit more complex because she's going to want some other things done, but um, we tried uh, the preservation method for her. And in this case, we needed to really rotate and stabilize her tips. So I uh, was able to use the lateral curl overlay method. So this is a structural method, uh, as well as tongue and groove, uh, ailer base reduction, which she wanted separately from uh, the other work. Uh, and so here she is postoperatively. A couple things to note. She does have a small residual hump. Uh, and this can happen, you know, in my hands with uh, Joseph method or uh, this method. And, uh, you know, if you, if you felt this nose, you wouldn't feel any irregularities. You just feel a natural little smooth bump there, which uh, to me is fine. And she's actually extremely happy with these results. Here she is in her frontal view, showing very nice dorsal aesthetic lines, very natural. Her tip hasn't changed at all. Here's her base view. Uh, and these are her preoperative scores, her primary concerns 
were the shape from the side, overall symmetry, and how well her nose fit her face. Uh, and here she is post-operatively. So uh, again, doing very well at 14 months. This is uh, a patient uh, whose primary concern was the, the, the frontal view asymmetry uh, and the gentle curve and totic tip. And this is a patient in whom we might classically do a hump reduction with Joseph methods and um, open a book osteotomies to shift the entire pyramid uh, towards the patient's right. In this case, I, I use the um, modified subdorsal strip method, but um, having seen this talked about by uh, Guxel and Charles East and other, uh, other folks who are doing this um, method, I realized that we could do an asymmetric letdown and drop this patient uh, into position. Interestingly, I think there was a recent paper out of Turkey uh, looking at results of this. So you may want to look that up in the journal. Um, and so I think we have some video here to show. So this is showing designing the ostectomy. You can actually measure the nasal length on each side to the midline and then decide how much you need to remove. And so uh, I had measured it prior to uh, those markings and realized I needed to take about three and a half millimeters at maximal point. So this is using the piezo uh, to perform our uh, osteotomy, the osteotomies all the way around. Uh, and so we're going to do an ostectomy on the patient's right side. And so you do the anterior, then the posterior cut first, uh, then second. Uh, and here we're going to see uh, a piece of bone being removed. This is our uh, bone removal. Okay. And our cartilage cuts uh, kind of as shown uh, uh, previously. Uh, this is just marking it out here. Sorry, it's kind of a hard, hard to see down there, but we're doing these cartilage cuts. We're going to resect a little bit of the cartilage here in a second. And I like to use a 15 blade for that. This is the cartilage removal. And then I like to mark where the uh, rhinion is, where the maximal point is, where I want the flexion to occur. And then you can use a 15 blade to make that cut, which I skipped through, and then a little cut with uh, either a through biter or preferably just a, a scissor to release that ethmoid bone so this will drop down into position. You want to make sure you don't remove too much so that the whole thing doesn't fall down. And a two millimeter os uh, osteotome to perform a transcutaneous osteotomy to drop this into position. Once we uh, suture this down, you're going to see uh, that uh, it is actually much straighter now. Uh, and that vault has sort of shifted into position. Uh, and, you know, the power of doing that unilateral ostectomy and, and tilting the whole thing to position is really can't be understated. I've been very, very pleased with uh, those results. And so this is our Gunter diagram showing what we did. Uh, ostectomy on the right side, shifting the whole pyramid toward that side. A septal extension graft in addition, so another structural technique uh, to go along with osteocartilaginous preservation uh, and a few other maneuvers. And uh, this is an early post-op. I've uh, asked this patient to come in a couple of times more recently for her uh, post one year results. Um, and because of COVID, I think there's some hesitation for a lot of patients to come in, but hopefully she'll come in for her long-term follow-up. I understand she's doing very well. You can see the tip rotation, uh, dorsal hump reduction and improvement, never 100% straight, but much improved on frontal view. And I really like the way those dorsal aesthetic lines are looking uh, for her. And Schnauz scores showing much improvement uh, at uh, four months postoperatively. Another uh, patient with asymmetric, uh, with asymmetry of the dorsum, a small hump wasn't her major concern. She really just wanted to be straighter. Again, three millimeter letdown on the right side, asymmetric uh, ostectomy to allow the entire pyramid to shift over, tongue and groove with supple extension grafting uh, to allow this to shift into position. Much better on frontal view three-quarters view uh, and side view. Six-month follow-up and Schnauz scores are much improved. And um, this is a, a case where I want to again show the structural techniques that we can do on the tip in addition to dorsal hump reduction. So she really wanted her tip reduced, alar basis reduced, and her gently curved hump, which is an ideal candidate for dorsal preservation, uh, reduced. And so uh, bilateral two millimeter letdown was performed along with the modified subdorsal strip method. We've done our um, osseocartilaginous fault preservation. Here she is at relatively early, around seven months. She'll be coming in for her one year follow-up soon, I believe. 
uh, three quarters view, frontal view, close up frontal showing that tip, very natural looking tip, very natural looking dorsal aesthetic lines coming down to it, base view. Uh, and here her scores pre and post operatively at seven months. So you can see much improvement on all the aesthetic scores uh, and functional stable. So another difficult case, this is a case where uh, there's some asymmetry of the, of the dorsum and a totic wide tip with thick skin, with modified subdorsal strip um, and a push down, not a letdown in this case, because I didn't want it to go down too far, uh, ailer spanning suture and other things to the tip, uh, mini lateral curl strut grafts and so on. So here she is nine months postoperatively. You can see the stability of that nasal tip, um, three quarters view, uh, frontal view showing good dorsal aesthetic lines, a really nice uh, tip conformation, much more symmetric, uh, and base view. Uh, and her scores much improved uh, postoperatively. So you may wonder what is what is the uh, difference between the structural methodology versus the traditional methodology in terms of airway preservation. You're going to hear people say that one's better than the other. So we did a study in a few cadavers to look at this. Essentially what we did was a Joseph Hump reduction in three cadavers, then we did a push down operation in three cadavers, and then we took those three push downs and converted them to let down operations, whereby we resected some of that bone shown in the uh, upper right hand corner there, uh, and then looked at the internal valves and all of these on CT scans. And basically we found that with a push down method where the bone is being pushed into the nasal vault, we had decreased internal valve area. Um, but the let down and Joseph with auto spreaders, so a mid vault reconstruction method showed stable internal uh, nasal valve area. So, you know, we didn't really conclusively determine whether one's better than the other, but showed that the airway is similarly stable and preserved and let down versus uh, Joseph methods, as long as you use mid vault reconstruction, but the push down definitely had some problems with uh, impaction of the uh, internal valve. And subsequent to us more recently, uh, Yves Saban and Valerio uh, did a study in actual patients showing uh, pretty similar findings. So again, to summarize, structural preservation is combining the best of both worlds, in my opinion. It's, it's allowing us to combine osteocartilaginous vault preservation in the right patients with structural tip tripod techniques, which are something that I feel uh, are the best way for me to get the results that I want in my patients. Uh, and so it means doing, for me, a modified subdorsal strip method uh, for the control it gives me along with all the other things like tongue and groove, mini lateral curl strut grafts, lateral curl overlay, septal extension grafts, even anterior septal reconstruction, all the things that we want to do uh, in the lower, uh, lower third of the nose. And so we can combine them together with open structural techniques. To me, it's, it's just another tool in the toolbox. Again, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but if you have a whole bunch of tools you can provide your patients, it does make it harder sometimes because you may wonder which one would be best uh, but as you develop experience, you'll find that you do have more tools that you can provide your patients uh, and hopefully get uh, even better results. Again, I want to stress using the uh, functional and aesthetic outcomes instrument is very important, and I encourage you to use the, the Schnoss. It's now translated into multiple languages, so our colleagues around the world are adopting it, and it'll allow us to speak the same language when we, when we look at results in rhinoplasty patients. This tension in rhinoplasty between aesthetics and function is something that we can't ignore. This is my contact information. I'd like to thank the society for having me again, and um, I'll take any questions. Thank you.